You guys, I am feeling this, and we are kicking off a new teaching series today called We the Church. You can take a seat, be seated. This series is called We the Church, and we're gonna journey through the beginning of the book of Acts in order to declare what the church is and clarify what the church is not. Because the more you understand God's plan for the church, the more you'll walk in the purpose for his church, amen? I feel like God's church is a lot like God's word. The more you learn it, the more you start to love it, the more you start to love it, the more you start to live it. Because we don't go to church, Red Rocks. We are the church, amen? amen. All right, this message is called, What Are We Waiting For? What are we waiting for? So let's pray. Holy Spirit, light a renewed passion within us to be and build your church. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, how many of you are uh, homebodies? You know what I mean? Not homeboys, Andrew, homebodies. <laughs> um, let's do this. Let's take a vote between these two things. Which of these Friday nights sounds better to you? A night out on the town, give me a cool restaurant and a concert home by 1230 at the earliest, or... Uber Eats straight to your front door, your favorite restaurant, dinner, and a movie on your couch with your favorite blanket. Let's just take a vote right now. Divide this church in half. Who's taking the night out? Give me the night out. And then where are my homebodies at? Let me see you. Um, shout out to Nate Bergazzi for this joke right here. He is my new favorite comedian, and he's a decent golfer which means he's my new hero also. But he jokes, in your 20s, when your friends call you and say, hey man, let's go out. You don't even ask, what are we doing? You say, yeah, I'm in, let's go. Where are we going? I don't care. I'll burn my apartment down, bro, let's go. <laughs> and then by the time you hit your 30s, you start asking questions like, oh, where are we going? Is it loud? Yeah. <laughs> Is this the church with the rock and roll music? I'm going to drive separate. <laughs> and then by your 40s, you're like, oh, I'm not going. I'm mad that you'd even ask me. <laughs> I'm not going, I'm staying home. I got a crazy night playing with some chamomile tea in my favorite mug. No thank you. <laughs> Just, um, here's the thing. That, that's, that's like normal and natural, maybe even a good thing with weekends, but what happens with our Friday nights tends to eventually happen with our faith as well. I'm comfy, I'm good. I'm a little timid, I'm a little scared, like I'm, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stay home. And God told me to, to bring this announcement to tell you today, you can take it up with my boss, he's a Jewish carpenter, oh that joke is so cheesy. Um, but he told me to tell you today what he's been telling me all week. For a lot of us, your faith needs to get out more. The book of Acts is the story of what it looks like when the followers of Jesus and their faith gets out more. The book of Acts, my favorite book in the entire Bible, it was written by Luke, the same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke, look at you guys, which means it is the second volume of a two-part story about Jesus and his church. You know how some TV shows, they do a recap at the start of the episode? Previously on Ted Lasso. <laughs> Previously on the first 18 seasons of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Meredith still lives in Seattle. <laughs> We highly recommend she leaves because everything that could go wrong for her seems to go, I'll stop, but I'm right. <laughs> Previously on We the Church, on the, on the Acts of the Apostles, after predicting his own death and resurrection, Jesus is back from the grave. And then we pick it up in Acts 1, verse 1. In my first book, I told you, Theopolis, remember this is Luke writing, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Now, my first thought when I read that is something that Sean said a few years ago. We're not building an audience, we're building an army. And Jesus gave instructions on building, to, building the church to those he chose. You don't give an audience instructions, you entertain an audience. You give an army instructions. 
And hey, I'll I'll be the first to say, like at this church, unapologetically, we believe church should be enjoyed and not endured. It is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. We will never apologize for our culture of celebration. We stole that from Heaven's Playbook, okay? That is, our, that is our culture and always will be. And at the same time, if the only reason you go to church is for entertainment or even to feel good, can I just suggest so many better venues for you than the church? And, and the reason I'm coming out fired up is because I, I love you and I'm on assignment to declare what the church is and clarify what the church is not because if the only reason, if you only ask what the church can do for you and give to you, you will continue to miss the point and you will continue to go from church to church frustrated because the church isn't being for you what it never promised or was supposed to be for you in the first place. And then one day, the only church legacy you'll pass on to your kids is your critiques of the 20 churches y'all kind of attended while they grew up. If you look for reasons to leave, you will always find them at every church. But if you know the reasons to stay and plant yourself in the house of the Lord, then something in you will come alive and grow. We are the church. Jesus instructs those he chooses. I just wonder today if you know you're chosen. And I wonder today if you know what a miracle your very existence is. Not to get too eighth grade biological health class on you, but the fact that that exact sperm fertilized that exact egg at that exact moment in time. I mean, the very reality that you are you and all the events that transpired to get you to Red Rocks today to to hear this message. You thought you were just going to church to to make mom happy so that she'd pay for brunch. What you didn't know is you have a divine appointment with the maker of the universe who wants you personally to know that you are chosen and called and made on purpose for a purpose by a God who has no shortage of reasons for why. And a key and critical component to his good plans for you are caught up in you actively playing a role in building and being the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says it this way. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. I love that. We are his workmanship created in advance to do the works he has planned for us. How much purpose and meaning does that give your Monday and Monday? Everybody gets in on it. Everybody benefits. In other words, you're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You, you, didn't, yeah, you didn't pick your birthday. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose to be born in the country you were born in. You didn't decide to be alive. God did. God made you, and the church needs what he has placed within you. And that's what the welcome party at this place is for, by the way. It's a kickstart to help you start discovering your calling and your purpose. That's why we kind of sound like a broken record around here at times, challenging you to get on a team, challenging you to get in a group and and serve and sacrifice alongside of us because together there, there ain't nothing this church can't do. So what are we waiting for? Let's go change the world, not just so we can reach more people, but because for you personally, you will never walk in the abundance and fullness of your calling and purpose in life without the church. I'm feeling this. Jesus instructs those he chooses to build the church. Let's keep going. Verse three. During the the 40 days after Jesus suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So don't miss that. Jesus hung out with them. He had meals with them. He talked to them. Why is that crazy? Because he was dead just a few days ago. And now he's hanging out with them. This is all happening right after the original Easter, that by his crucifixion, Jesus opened the door to the kingdom of God, and by his resurrection, he proved it. John 14, verse six says this. This is Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. A lot of my meetings and conversations recently, I've heard this said a lot, that Christianity is exclusive. And I just wanted to unpack that for a moment, and not that God needs me to be his defense attorney, but I just kind of feel like having his back on this one. I just kind of want, I want to make sure all of us are using the same dictionary, 
when we say that Christianity is actually exclusive. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Because we've got a culture that's really compelled by Jesus right now. Not everything Jesus said. Some of the stuff, kind of like build a bear, build your Jesus, build a Bible, build your truth, pick and choose the verses that make you feel good and ignore all the ones that, that don't. Jesus can be my savior, but not necessarily my Lord. John 14, six is one of the first verses that gets cut. Oh, Jesus is, is the way? No one comes to the Father except through, through Jesus? I mean, I agree. At first glance, it kind of sounds exclusive. But Jesus doesn't back down. In fact, he says it a different way in John 10, 9. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will enter into the kingdom of heaven. They will come in and they will go out and find pasture. Exclusive. You ever try to get into a nightclub only to get rejected at the door? This happened to me in, at the Omnia nightclub at the Caesars Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. I love Vegas references and sermons because for every one person that walks out offended, offended, there's like 40 people who go, I found my people, man. I found my people. Um, at a club, you get let in or rejected based on your status, who you're with, how you look, what you're worth. That, that is called being exclusive. And by the way, it is the opposite heart of the kingdom of God. I mean, we know this, right? The church is not a country club for those of us who have it all together. It's a hospital for those of us who know we don't. And nowhere will you find a church that proves that more than right here. <laughs> I mean, if you just look at John 3, 16, we all know this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that, what's that word? Whoever. I mean, is there a less exclusive word than whoever? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus being the one and only son of the one and only God and the one and only door into the kingdom of heaven is not exclusive because everyone's invited and anyone is on the list. It's not exclusive, follow me, it's specific. It's not exclusive, it's specific. Jesus is the way to the God. By the way, that is the truth claim of Christianity. By the way, every religion makes a truth claim. Jesus is the only one that showed up dressed in grace. That's why I trust it. I picture just humanity separated from God by a canyon called sin. Now enter religion, because religion is our efforts to bridge the gap. And we think, if I could just be a little more gooder than bad, that I will somehow tilt these divine scales in my direction, and I will earn the favor and forgiveness that I need to spend the rest of forever in heaven with God. As if God grades on a scale, and we look around and we see some people, maybe not as sharp as us, and we go, well, I'm not, as, I'm not perfect, but I'm not divorced like my sister or a drug addict like my cousin. And these are, the, these are the silly religious games we play. So, so God's gonna let you into heaven because like, you don't party as hard as the rest of your friends because you, you're really into nonprofits and you're kind and you're a Republican, that's why. Because you go to church, your parents go to church because you're a good person. I mean, I'll give you that. Like, I think you're a great person, but what are we talking about here? A holy God who cannot exist where there is even a drop of sin, which means, do the math with me, what's required? You gotta bat a 1,000 and score 100% in this life, or you gotta find a different way. Us like trying to earn our salvation by being gooder. I'm like, man, when, when Mother Teresa, on her best day, doesn't come close, and if she was in this room, she'd be the first to amen that. We're separated from God by this canyon called sin. Jesus gave his life to become the bridge. God made a way when there was no way. Now imagine for a second, you're standing over here looking at this bridge and you go, only one bridge, God? Exclusive much? And I go, what? Like, how many bridges do you need to cross a canyon? The point is, there is a bridge and there didn't have to be. Do you have any idea how expensive that bridge is? Do you have any idea what that bridge cost God to make? 
So Jesus saying, I am the way and the truth, the life, the door, the bridge, not all roads, one road leads to heaven and it's me, is not exclusive, it's specific. So before we shake our fists at God for that, you guys, there shouldn't be any roads to heaven. It's not like there were eight and then God dwindled it down to one because Jesus wanted to be the guy. There was no door to heaven until God built the most expensive door in history. And the price was the perfect blood of his one and only son who was crushed on a cross. So 2,000 years later, I could say yes to his grace. We now have a way. And unlike Every other religion, it's not based on your performance motivated by fear. It's based on his performance motivated by love. That God would treat Jesus how you deserve. So for the rest of forever, God could treat you how Jesus deserves. And it's scandalous. I almost feel like bad saying it in front of a large group of people. Like it's, it feels just so scandalous, and that's what makes it the greatest news that there is. The church is called to have the same heart, that everybody's on this list. It's by his grace we're saved through our faith. The only cover charge is your confession. <laughs> and so to be so just crystal clear, like clarity is kindness, as if this could be, what if this is the last message I ever preach or the last sermon you ever hear? And I go, I just, you have to know this above and beyond any other information that exists. If you don't go to heaven one day, it is not because you're not on this list and it's not because you're not good enough as if any of us are. It'll be because time and time again, you walk past this door instead of through it. That's it. Everybody needs Jesus. And that, that's the heart of the kingdom of God. That's the heartbeat of this church. As long as Red Rocks has a pulse, our front doors will unapologetically swing as wide as possible so that as many people as possible can hear the greatest news ever they never thought could be possible for them. Because one thing that unites all of us is from beggar to the king, from the famous to the faceless of every, of every nation, zip code, generation, race, whoever, everybody needs a savior, which is why every week we just roll out the red carpet for prodigals to come home. That's it. For as long as God lets us have a heartbeat, that will be our vision. Let's keep going. Verses four through eight. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Jesus said, I don't even know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit will be our power to be witnesses, to make heaven more crowded from Denver to Austin, to Brussels, and beyond. So this is a picture of 1976. This is the house that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started a little company called Apple in that garage. The second picture, in 1994, this is uh, Jeff Bezos right after he quit his job in his garage to start a, a little online bookstore called Amazon. And then in 2004, this is the Harvard dorm room where Mark Zuckerberg and a few friends started Facebook. And here's, here's my point. All three of those are humble beginnings that have changed this world. All three of them. But my point is this. Those stories make sense. That's my point. That qualified people with grit and good ideas if they work hard, can build very successful companies. In other words, all three of those are natural movements. But to me, you wanna know what makes no sense is the church. 
that how does a ragtag group, group of uneducated and ordinary people start the greatest movement of love in history? How has it that, over, that even in the face of criticism, crit, like critique and persecution, the church has done nothing but blaze into a wildfire over the last 2,000 years and today in countries all over the world where it's illegal to gather and proclaim the name of Jesus, that the underground church is blowing up right now. Like how, how do you explain that? It doesn't make sense. There is no natural explanation for the church is what I'm saying. But there is a supernatural one, the Holy Spirit. The third essence of our three in one Try unity, God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Don't think about that too hard or you'll get a headache. I've been there before, it's not fun. The way I see it, God is the three best friends anybody could have. That's a hangover line, also filmed in Vegas, wow, okay. Leave now if you're like, nope, there's another church down the street. Um, we could have the best music on the planet give very inspirational messages, have beautiful buildings, beautiful graphics, and amazing hospitality, but without the Holy Spirit, we are nothing, and we've got nothing. In fact, without the Holy Spirit here, go somewhere else, and I'll go with you. If the Holy Spirit, if God's not here, this is a TED Talk and mass Christian karaoke. That's all this is. He is the power, the helper, the convictor, and the teacher. And if Jesus said it's literally, Jesus said it's literally better for him to leave so the Holy Spirit can show up, then I wanna live my life like I believe Jesus was telling the truth. I mean, you, you explained to me how Peter goes from denying Jesus to a small group of people at a bonfire to one month later, he is proclaiming and preaching the gospel to thousands of people where Acts chapter three records 3,000 people get saved because of a message Peter preached boldly about the gospel. How do you explain that difference? The Holy Spirit, that's it. The Holy Spirit is the supernatural explanation for the most uncommon movement that history knows about. We the church, amen? Verses nine through 11, after saying this, he, being Jesus, was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. We don't have time, but just to try to imagine that happening one day. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? What are you waiting for? Jesus has been taken into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven the same way you just saw him go. And I preached this entire message to get to this point right here. Because if you remember what Jesus said in John 10, nine, he said, I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I am the door into heaven. And then I just noticed this last week. They will go in and they will come out and find pasture. And so I have to believe as these angels are telling these, these guys, like, what, what are you waiting for? Why are you just staring up into the clouds? All of a sudden, they're having all kinds of flashbacks to all the things Jesus taught them over the last three years, specifically in the last month. It says Jesus came, he proved his crucifixion by his resurrection, he's teaching them about the kingdom of God. But then if you go back just a month, Right after the crucifixion and resurrection, the disciples are starting to hear about all these rumors of resurrection, but they're terrified. And scripture says they just, they lock themselves in a room because they're so scared. We read about this in John chapter 20, verses 19, to, 19 through 21. Do we have it? There we go. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. So he just walked through a wall. I don't know if you caught that. I mean, did he not? It says the doors were locked and then Jesus walked in. What's up? The disciples screamed, ah! He goes, peace. Check it out. Verse 20 and 21. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord and Jesus said again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. In other words, I am the door by which you might be saved, but I am also the door by which you might live called. 
you will come in and you will go out. In other words, what are you guys waiting for? I'm not just saving you, I'm also sending you. My church is not just to be a shelter from the world. My church is here to be a light to the world, an unstoppable force within this world. That he's not, he's not taking us out of it. He says, I'm sending you into it. In the world, not of the world, a light to the world for the sake of the world. But how many of us as Christians are, are saved on the way to heaven, but we lock ourselves behind doors of shame and fear and comfort, living saved but not fully living sent? I mean, shame will always tell you to hide. Maybe the reason you don't come around here a lot, maybe the reason you, you haven't gotten in a group or gotten on a team or thought you could be part of building this church is, is because you know it's, shame is convincing you. The accuser is convincing you that God can save you, but he can never use you. This God would never want you. And you think, you, you lock yourself behind doors of shame and think, man, if they only knew at this church the real story. That abortion four years ago, that addiction I still got. If they, shame will bully you all the way to the grave. It is relentless. But my Bible says Jesus endured the cross, despising its shame, which means not only did he pay the price for all of your sin, that Jesus absorbed every last drop and ounce of your shame on that cross, brought it with him into his grave. Speaking of shame bullying you until the grave, Jesus brought it into his grave and on the third day walked out and left it there to rot and decay. And in exchange, gives you a double portion of honor and glory. <laughs> Don't let shame lock you up. Don't let fear lock you up. How many of us saved and on the way to heaven but not living sent because we're locked behind doors of, of fear, fear calling all the shots in your life? How many of us let fear make all of our decisions, not just the little things we'll do today, but major life decisions and I let fear decide that for me rather than the maker of the universe partnering with me to sit down and, 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 and talk about the good plans that he has for me. I let fear just, just push me around. I'm too afraid of failing, so I won't step out and try. I'm too afraid of succeeding, so I won't, I won't step out and try. I'm too afraid of, sh like, just like, shame wants to be the anthem of your heart and, and fear wants to make every decision of your life. But church, I'm telling you, my wife and I, we, we didn't get married so that we could hunker down and start deadbolting our faith, okay? I didn't bring two beautiful little babies into this world to model for them how to, how to play it safe and deadbolt our faith and pray small and play small with the gifts God has given us. I don't wanna let fear make my decisions because I'm not just saved, I'm also sent. I'm not gonna let, an economy determine if I live a life of generosity or not. I'm walking out of my front door in the morning saying, Holy Spirit, how do you want to send me today? How do you want to use me today? Make me a force to be reckoned with today. The Holy, the Holy Spirit empowering me from the inside out to be his witness wherever it is that I go today because, man, for so many of us, especially in 2023, we're part of the greatest movement in history, saved by the blood of Jesus, and then our prayers somewhere along the way shift from, Lord, make us more bold and send us out to God, keep us safe. And I'm all for safety. I'm just saying Jesus didn't come to sell seatbelts and deadbolts, and the goal of your life is not to arrive safely at death. This life ain't it. It's not. The more you begin to live with eternity in mind, the more free you are in this life because it's like, what, what can touch you? To live as Christ, to die as gain. Have you ever thought about the second half of that verse? How crazy that is? That is freedom. It's like Lazarus, when he died, it was Jesus' buddy Lazarus, for four days was dead until Jesus showed up and said, Lazarus, stop being dead. And Lazarus stopped being dead. Walked out of his grave. You think anything freak Lazarus out for the rest of his life after that? You think anything scares that guy? Death? Been there, done that. Kind of just frustrated at Jesus for dragging me back here. But while I'm here, let's go. <laughs> Shame will always tell you to hide. Fear will always bully you and try to make decisions for you. Does your faith need to get out more? You battle comfort with mission.
and purpose. It is our calling not to come to church. It is our calling to be the church. It's comfy to live saved. It's our calling to be sent. So let me ask you this one question really quick. On a scale of one to 10, what is your boldness level today? Or this season? This is rhetorical, okay? But I've been thinking about this for me all month because mine's been lower than you might expect for a pastor and a preacher. What is your boldness level? And pray for an opportunity, maybe before this series is over, for God to give you a chance to, to share the gospel. Because here's, I'm gonna challenge you and call you to a higher level of evangelism and being that witness to the ends of the earth. Because for most of us, our only play in the evangelism playbook is, let me invite you to church so Sean can tell you the gospel. And that's beautiful and that's amazing. Keep doing that. Heaven's getting more crowded, that's the point. But maybe it's time to add another play to your playbook. What if you took them to coffee and you explained the gospel? You might say, well, I don't know what I'd say. I have no, well, then I would say, maybe go watch Sean's Easter message from last weekend again and listen to it in a different way, not for you, but for them. It'll root more different and deeply in your heart and in your gut when you listen with the intention of, I gotta be ready because I'm passing this information on to somebody else. The gospel will take hold of you in higher and deeper levels just because you're listening to it with them in mind. So what if before this uh, We The Church series was over, you took somebody to coffee and you shared the gospel with them. I'm telling you, nothing will light your spirit on fire and energize your, your soul like walking out of your front door saying, God, make me a witness today. Like you can walk out of this room, whatever this room is for you, we've all got them. You can walk out of this room because Jesus walked out of his tomb. He walked into that room so the disciples wouldn't stay there. He's saying, do you have any idea how much power is behind this movement that you're starting? The gates of hell cannot prevail against this. Nothing is gonna stop me from building my church. Even the name Jesus Christ, have you ever noticed it elicits a response from people? Not just spiritually, but physically. You either love it or you hate it. Nobody's neutral. Like I'm 34, I've never seen somebody accidentally hit their thumb with a hammer and go, ah, Buddha! What the heck, universe? the frickin' stars, and on my birthday month! <laughs> it's because deep down you know those things aren't listening, but deep down you know Jesus is. That's why you will swear in his name when you're mad, and you will pray in his name when you're desperate, and you will praise his name when you're grateful. He has overcome the world, church. Billions of people will not gather in churches like this and rooms like this all over the world to worship a dead good guy or an ancient homeboy who was a good teacher way back in the day. They gather for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords alone. Nothing will stop this movement. Nothing will stop it. You think about it this way. The Roman Empire flexed its power by crucifying people. Jesus laid down his power by being crucified. Fast forward 2,000 years, and Jesus is more alive than he's ever been, and Jesus is the reason you just took that breath right now. Him and his amazing grace. And if you want to learn about the Roman Empire, you got to go to Wikipedia. That was sassy, but I'm feeling this right now. He is the hinge of history who has completely divided time in half. The BC AD calendar, you can't look at a calendar without seeing Jesus, which means that every tyrant and dictator who has ever or will ever live will have no say in the matter but to have their birthdays, their reigns, and even their deaths measured and recorded in history based on a baby fugitive who was born poor in a cave with no platform and no prominence that is supernatural in every possible way. This movement cannot be stopped. So whatever door you're hiding behind today, I'm challenging you to pray a dangerous prayer. You can pray, God, keep us safe. I'm telling you to pray, God, also make us bold. You know, the disciples were beaten and whipped for proclaiming the gospel. And after they got released from jail, their prayer was, Lord, continue to make us bold so that we would not stop. Simply talking about what we have seen and heard. When Jesus said, let there be light, 
light exploded out in every direction, the universe has been expanding in every direction at the speed of light ever since. What God speaks into existence cannot be contained. And 2,000 years ago, he spoke the church into existence. It will not be contained. We know the truth. We just need to know the time. It's now. Today is the day for salvation. This is the week of invitation. This is the month for you to become a storyteller of the gospel. For the Holy Spirit gives instructions to those he chooses and you're chosen. And the Holy Spirit will empower you to be his witnesses from here all the way to the ends of the earth. And I'm telling you, for all we've seen, we ain't seen nothing yet. For the church's history is not as great as her destiny. Will you stand? Let's stand. Holy Spirit, would you just take over right now? Would you light a flame and light a passion? Maybe in some of us for the first time, maybe in some of us it's been far too long since we felt it or experienced it. Light a passion in us. To even right now, witness to you and bless your name. With every drop that we have within us, we give it back to you in the form of praise as you ignite us to be the church. In Jesus' name, and everybody said.